couple months back, we started our study in the intertestament period. In between where the Old Testament ends and the New Testament begins is roughly 400 years. It's often ta- has been called the time of silence, so we don't really know what much what went on. Um, it was 400 years that there was no prophet of God, there was no writer of scripture, there was no one walking and pronouncing, thus saith the Lord. Um, we do know that the Jewish empire, the Jewish empire never was an empire, but the Jews learned to deal with the Babylonians and, needed, and learned to deal with the Persians, and they learned how to deal with the, uh, the Greeks. And we're wrapping that, we're wrapping everything up in the next couple of minutes, probably before 11 o'clock, I would hope, so we can get into the books. This study has a threefold, I'm trying to fill in the gaps and to share things with you. And so we're, di- we've, first of all, and we're ending the imperialists, the four world empires. Jesus is born into the Roman Empire, the last one. We also are going to look at the books, the writings, papyrus, look at what was being written and what went on in those 400 years. Then we will end with politics and religion. And that's, um, I want to say, I keep saying, this is the best one to be at today, but I, I look at that one, and when we get to religion and politics, I'll clear up any questions that you have on who was who and what was what in the New Testament. I've, it's, I got it down for you. I really do, and I'm not pulling your leg. Um, when I started putting this all together, and I started using these as pieces of a puzzle, not just history and information, all of a sudden pictures started coming together. And who belonged to what and where they fit, and who their buddies were, and how alliances were made, and what went on. And that's all, that's all coming up in that. But we want to finish the imperialists and the Roman Empire. And I was doing a countdown. I started at 10, and that started roughly at 380-something before Christ, B.C. And every now and then, some days, we got two or three or four of the numbers dropped down as we went down, as people were born and they were getting closer and closer and we're to the end of time until the Gospels take over and Christ is born. Now we're down to number one, and number one, as I started last week with Jesus, Christ is born, and that's what we've been working to. However, we came into a snag, and I ran out of time, and I said, you don't have this, I'm not going to leave it up there while you write page after page after page, and so the only sheet of paper right now that you should have front and back is the imperialists, the Romans, and it's an addendum. Are we good? Amen. This will go fast. You guys are brilliant. Okay, I gave you a line, and the men that I gave you in that line too were actually and should have been the kings on the throne of Israel. All of those names were the, were the original rightful heirs, and, sh- and we, bo- we were just counting right down. I didn't tell you that. I left that out there for you to sort of, what's that? And some of you went and started looking up names, and that's good. All of those names are listed in Matthew, right off the bat, in the chronological order, in the line of Joseph. All of those men should have been the kings, but they were all disqualified by their great, 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 great grandfather by the name of Jeconiah. He was a king. And he pulled some really stupid stuff, and God said the following things. Jeconiah is also called in the Bible Jehoiakim, or he's called Kaniah-ish for short. That's a nickname in the book of Jeremiah. He was a king of Judah, and he was deported as part of the Babylonian captivity. And we already find this in scripture verses, and there's some for your references in that. He was the last king of Israel deported out. He is listed in the genealogy. You can find his name in Matthew 1.12. The curse of Jeconiah or Kaniah or Jehoiakim is found in Jeremiah 22. First, the Lord likens the king. Why would, why would Joseph and all those other his forefathers, all the way back to him, what would be so great that they would never reign? 
They couldn't. The, the, the bloodline had to go to over, move over slightly from David and went straight to Mary. First, the Lord likens the king to a signet ring on God's hand, a ring that God will pull off. Then God pronounces this curse. Record this man as if childless, no heirs. A man who will not prosper in his lifetime, for none of his offspring will prosper. None will sit on the throne of David or rule anymore in Judah. This curse ended at when Jer Joseph was born. There's nowhere else to go, and Jesus was born. Mary became the bloodline. Now, you, let's back up, and before we keep moving on, and I just wanted to drop this in here. What was it so raunchy and what was it so bad? What did the guy do that God could say, okay, I could take you off of my finger. You're, you're in the line. You're in the line to be king. The ring gets transferred to the next king. God says, I can remove, your, I can remove a ring anytime I want. You know, the, the word of God tells us we got some lousy, raunchy rulers today in the world, don't we? We've got a bunch of lousy louts and rascals in Washington. We've got them in every state. We have, we have people that should not be in politics and just should, should not be there. They don't belong there. And that's going to happen. But you know, the Bible tells us that the, that the heart of the king is in God's, God's hands. Rulers are in God's hands. Sometimes, you've got to understand, we usually get what we deserve in politicians. What we are as a nation, not as an individual necessarily, but what we are as a people, or as a Floridian, or as a, what's a Seminole Knight called? Uh, just a Seminole guy who lives in the city of Seminole. We get, we generally get what we deserve and what we lo let go on. And usually our silence is what sets up the, the bad stuff. Jeconiah was not a good king. He would not, he had an opportunity he, he came at the rears of revival was going on, and he followed kings that loved the Lord and was serving the God, and he, he came in and violently just came up and said, that's it, nothing. We are worshiping for the final time. No more God of Jehovah, of Israel, whoever he is. We are worshiping the real gods. And so God says, I've had enough of this dude. And that's what he did. This brings us to Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus. Why am I doing this? I'm tracing the Roman Empire and how Jesus was lived under the Romans. That's what you all have on that sheet of paper. How did Christ survive and grow up in the Roman Empire? Right off the bat, he is affected even before he's born. Because Caesar Augustus is a what? A Roman. Very good. All right. You've got to get that down. Caesar Augustus is a? Thank you. Good. And this taxing was first made, and all went to be taxed to his own city. Joseph went up from Galilee. Now, when it says up from, Galilee is way north of Jerusalem and Bethlehem. But they went up. It's talking about they ascended in altitude. It was a climb up. They're down in the lush valley areas and they had to travel uphill is the way to go to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary. And so it was, while they were there, the days were accomplished, should be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room in the end. The next encounter outside of Herod who was not Roman, but was a puppet in the Roman Empire, pronouncing, let's kill all of the children, because the wise men said, we're going to look for, we know the king of the Jews has been born. Problem, the issue was, that was the title of Herod. He had been given that by the Roman Empire, and he was called the king of the Jews. And so he says, there's only one king. I can take care of this real quick. I'll just get rid of all of them. You have to be a very perverted, mad, demon-possessed person to want to kill children. Think about that and put that in context. We do not want to face the reality of demons and wickedness 
working. We don't want to, we don't want to see that. We don't want to be part of that. Get that away from us. But you have to be as mad as this one, this one was to kill live children as some people are suggesting that we ought to do as a society in our country. It's insane. Totally insane. Amen. I'm, gl I'm glad I saved this for today. It's good preaching stuff. Man. <laughs> Caesar Augustus would overlap with Jesus' growing up being the carpenter's son. Jesus would be 18 years of old age when Caesar Augustus died. Tiberius would become the next Caesar, and 16 years later, in 30 AD, Luke 3.1 pops up, or really at 25 AD, 30 AD we're coming at. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, that's how I did the math, Pontius, here's, here's a Roman, Pontius Pilate is a, be careful, Who is Pontius Pilate? I got you, didn't I? He's Roman. Okay, Herod is not a Roman. He's, he's Idumean and he's hated. Okay, Pontius Pilate was, is a Roman. And being the governor of Judea, and here's Herod, another Herod, his brother, another Herod, and they are all living in Luke chapter 3. Year, in the year 27 A.D., there's a city on the west coast of the Sea of Galilee called Tiberias, named after the Caesar, Caesar Tiberius. He named it, he made this, he changed the city and built it, or actually he built a new city near one, and he said, oh, I'm the Caesar, my name is Tiberius. I think we need a name for this town and we'll call it Tiberius, wow. And Jesus told his disciples never to go in that town because it was totally built and turned over to the Roman lifestyle. Roman culture, everything, nothing. No, it was all their gods and their lifestyle and their lascivious living. It was eat, drink, and be merry. At bad places, Jesus said, don't you even go in there. They just leave it alone. In Mark 12, verses 13 through 17, the Herodians appeared to Jesus and his disciples about paying taxes. Now, who are the Herodians? Okay, Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, or Romans? They're Greeks, that's right. The Herodians, that was their nickname. They're Hellenists. And they, they, these guys, wait a minute, hang on. No, Herodians. Okay, these are, my, my fault. Um, these are Jews. That, these, are, these are Jews that follow Herod. That followed Herod. I'm reading wrong, Sorry. But this, here's Caesar again, and Caesar is a Roman. Luke 23, the trials, Pontius Pilate, a Roman. Luke 23, the crucifixion. And if you look at all of these things, Jesus was beaten by Romans. He was nailed to the cross by them. Roman soldiers stood at the cross. One of them believed. Said, this is the Son of God. Joseph of Arimathea asked Roman Pilate for the body. Roman Pilate puts a Roman guards at the tomb. The Roman guards are bribed and then to lie. The good news is none of that, nothing of that stopped it. Nothing, it, nothing stopped God. <coughs> This is our first little journey and our major journey through the 400 years. If you, didn't, if you didn't see the line up to Jesus, if you didn't follow God's working with God's people through other cultures and other kingdoms and bad times as well, most of the time was apathetic times, asleep times. Just do what the, do what the boss, the, the govern, government says, and we'll get along fine. And they did, for the most part. Then you get idiots and mad people, power-hungry people, that think, well, we need to do this and do this and change this and mess this up. And there's problems, but it settles down. But the fiercest empire of all, Jesus was born to. And they could not keep him in a tomb, even with their soldiers. And he rose again. And the cool thing is, now it's our turn. 
God's called us to go and preach the gospel to all of the world, to all of creation. We have the power, we have the ability, we've got technology coming out our ears that we can't even catch up to, to get the gospel out and to share Jesus Christ with people. Well, I went three, three minutes over.